a little bit overwhelming right now. Uh, it's, it's been a while since I have feel like I've had an impression from God that I need to, I just feel like I want to share. And I'm busy saying, well, do you want to bring God here? You can choose to do that. So um, the word I got was just as I was worshiping and seeing the shape of this building, so asymmetrical since we're talking maths in church. Um, and just thinking of my own journey of how it's not been square. It's been its own mess, excitement, all of the things, all of the feels. Um, and I just was really encouraged that God loves me, even, even how messy or asymmetrical it was, that whether it's traditional methods or the structure of what we think or view church should be, um, my, my journey has never been that. I've always felt I was over here. Um, and thinking like, man, does, does God even love me? I'm over here. I don't, it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit the mold. I see things, I hear things, I feel things. Um, I'm aware of things. I try to understand things differently uh, and ask a lot of questions and curiosity of who God is and how, how he's real. I want to know the realness of God. And so be okay to be asymmetrical. Um, I feel like God really encouraged me in that today. Thank you. All right, you guys. Whew. I haven't cried during worship like that since biomechanics of deliverance. If you remember me weeping here at the, at the foot of the altar, Whew. Okay, I had to go fix my face before this one. So um, for those of you watching on YouTube, I fixed my face for you. You're welcome. I did forget the clicker, though. So Mama Tiff, you want to pass me that clicker? Thank you. Does anyone else feel like their journey with the Lord has been asymmetrical at, at best? Zigzag, forward, backward, one step forward, 20 major dark steps back. Okay, so... I love what Taylor said, and I feel like it's so perfect for what we're going into today. I feel like of all the things I've had in my life, and I've, I've had a lot of experience, I grew up with wealth, ability to travel, so I got like the worldly experience. All I ever really wanted to seek after was the heart of God. It was the only thing in my life that was ever consistent. It was the only thing that ever felt like it made sense. And I think when I was 19 and the peace of Jesus came in, because I was raised Jewish, so I've always known God, the Father. I've always known that since the moment I first opened my eyes as a baby. I knew God the Father. I didn't know Jesus until I was 19. So we've been playing with this idea of paradigms, right? So I had this beautiful, depthful relationship with God the Father, and when Jesus came in, I didn't know how to put the peace in. I knew it was real, but I struggled with how to fit it into my existing paradigm. I pressed, I stretched, I eventually got baptized that same year. So I stretched a lot. If any of you have ever been like around people that are Jewish, especially Jewish intellectuals, Zan knows what I'm talking about. There is a very shame-based ideology around, in many ways, even really extending into a true relationship with God. I remember going to my father and saying, like, do you really believe in God? And I think we'd even just come from temple. And he was like, well, you know, I like the idea of it. I'm like, that's not what I asked you. Like, I like the idea of God. I like going to temple. It makes me feel good on high holidays. That's about all I got. So trying to fit Jesus into my paradigm and all that would mean about my family that would possibly make fun of me or ostracize me for the family or cancel me. That was a tough thing to do. But because I knew God the Father and I knew that he was so good and that he had revealed so much to me in my life, I knew that the way he brought Jesus into my life, I had to find a way to stretch my paradigm to let him in. 
And let me tell you, I'm so glad that I did because it changed my life forever in immense ways. So when Taylor said, like, I just, like, I want to know God. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to know what some guy at the pulpit tells me I should know about God. I want to know God. So how many of you in your walk with God have had pastors that continually try to put themselves in the center of your relationship? Is that biblical? I don't believe that that's biblical. I believe God consistently wants us to seek after him, not seek after a man that's really good at talking about him, right? I, I can deliver a message because God has given me the ability and authority to do so. That doesn't mean you seek after me. You seek after him. Anyone that is good at delivering a powerful message as a mouthpiece for God should then get out of the way. I shouldn't ever be in the way of you connecting with God. Today, when we go into this teaching, I want you to go into it with a childlike curiosity. When we look at some of the very legalistic Christian messaging, there's this idea that curiosity is bad. Has anyone been raised with this idea that curiosity is bad? Don't, right? Curiosity gets you to hell. Don't be curious. Don't ask questions. Just adhere to the legalist message I'm telling you and just stay out of hell. In fact, it's a true story. Jess knows about this one. Papa Gord knows about this one. I went to my kids' play at a church here. And at the end of the play, I'll just say, because obviously, you know, I don't want to like throw this person under the bus, but there is a message that was, if I had to put like a top 10 list of the top 10 things I would never want my kids to ever really hear about God in the beginning, if he found a way to put it in 30 minutes, I don't know. Maybe it was even, maybe he fit it into 15 minutes, I'm not so sure. But I sat there and the whole time, I just felt this pressure of God on me saying, it's okay, you, you're here for a reason, you had to experience this for, for a reason. When you are able to bring your kids into a full, manifold understanding of who God is and not just why you should be so afraid of hell because you don't want to go to the lake of burning fire. I mean, it literally was like, if that's what you really want to impart to your kids, you can do that on your time. That's not the part of God that I feel my children need to hear first. Then you choose God out of fear. Well, I just don't want to go to hell. That's not truly knowing God. That's not a foundation you can stand on through the hard times. Well, I don't want to do, I just don't want to go to hell. I just don't want to go to hell. I work with people all the time in break method who have turned their back on God in a very real, very problematic way just because of that, just to spite that idea that whatever this God is, it's going to throw me in a lake of fire. I don't think so. I'm turning away from it. Brandon, I see you. I see you smiling, laughing there. Did you do this? A little bit. Okay. So this is what I want us to go into today is looking at this idea of those things can be true at the same time that God can also be a good God and have manifold wisdom and understanding and fullness that he wants us to know his nature and character, not just what a possible consequence is, right? When you're teaching your child how to become a good person, you don't want them purely fearing the consequence. You want them to understand why they should choose differently, right? Yeah. Right? If you're not doing that, we should be, right? When a kid just doesn't want to get a spanking, but they don't really understand fundamentally how to not do the action that's getting them a spanking, you have a problem. You're going to have to do a lot of spanking. Because just the fear of the consequence without the instruction of how to actually walk in this new behavior, you're setting your kid up for failure. I believe a lot of the church is setting up God's children for failure. You can't just be afraid of a consequence. To walk with the Lord, you have to have a deep understanding of his character. You have to know how to hear his voice. If you don't understand his character and his voice, how can you have discernment? Can you? Is that possible? I don't think so. So I believe God has a message for us today where he wants to, to see that possibly we've been shown that God belongs in this box or maybe this box, maybe even this box, right? I keep seeing a vision of like the Russian nesting dolls. 
right? Where it's like, you're raised up in this church, and then one day you go to another church, and you're like, okay, well, it's got a little bit of this, but now there's also a whole lot of this, and then you go to another church, and you're like, wow, these are, I've, I feel like I see the thread, but none of these are the same. I believe God's trying to show us how we can expand and stay true to the word. So let's all close our eyes. I want to open with a prayer. <sighs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so grateful for this space. We're grateful for this time, this company, for Taylor actually coming up to the stage and actually letting this powerful prophetic word unleash into this space. God, we know that you want us to know you for who you are, not just for what you can give to us, what sort of deals we can make, or what we're afraid of receiving as a consequence, but to truly seek after who you are, your heart, your character. God, we want to know your voice. We want to recognize your voice. And God, my prayer is that every single person here today takes responsibility for where they've been playing it safe out of fear and tuning out the manifold wisdom you're trying to bring into their life. God, we know that Every one of us is here for a time such as this. While the contrast in the world is high, the dark is dark, the light is light, God, we are asking that you elevate us into that light, ready to fully receive your revelation and to follow closely to your voice and your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. We're going to open up with Ephesians 3, 10 through 19. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Manifold wisdom is like those Russian nesting dolls, and they never stop. Somehow every new one reveals a new one. Every time you think you've reached the edge, there's more. When we try to comprehend God, we are immediately limited by the fact that we are human. We can't possibly even conceive in that many dimensions. I know for some of you that listened to Zan's talk yesterday and she showed you the, the topological mapping, right? Did that blow your mind where it's like, is it a coffee cup or a donut? So when we think of it this way, I'm gonna let the train pass. Choo-choo. Okay, so when we think of that topological mapping, think about how many facets that thing had, right? So any slight angle you move it, there's more. There's always more. This is how the manifold wisdom of God works. Just when you think you've learned everything, what do you find out? There's so much more. And in fact, whenever we pick up the word, and we show up with the right heart posture, God is able to reveal manifold wisdom literally through one word. I bet you, you could study one passage for a year and get something new out of it every time. The Bible is a living word. Has anyone had this experience? Right? Where you go back to something and you're like, God, I really didn't think I read that the first time that way, but somehow this time it's impressing this upon my heart. How could that be? We're going to find out today. It's alive. Let's take a look at the appreciation of the mystery. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. What is your inner man? Your spirit, right? Your spirit that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is with the width and length and depth and height. Weird. They're actually describing dimensions here. 
All right. To know the love of Jesus Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I have taught to large groups before on the multidimensionality of God. And people will be like, are you just making this up? How do you know that God is like, where is this dimensional language coming from? Ephesians and so much more. Right. I mean, God. This is dimensionality, right? May be able to comprehend all of the knowledge which has width, length, depth, height, and so much more. That's basically saying like 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D, and beyond. The multidimensional aspect of God and the heavenly realms, it is biblical. It's not new age. It's actually right here. Let's define manifold, because there's two different ways to define manifold. So we've got the biblical definition, which is multicolored or multidimensional. Immediately when I thought of this, I saw Joseph's jacket, right, his, his robe. So here's a depiction of what this may have looked like, right? So think about even the way the pattern of the colors is done, right? It, it's like a prism, right, where you see these kind of fractals or bends in light. There's a multicolored, multidimensional expansion of God's wisdom. Dictionary definition, many and various, or, and I love this one too, and this is how we're going to use it primarily today, is a collection of points forming a certain kind of set. So I want you to think of that. A collection of points that form a set. So when we think of points forming a set, do we see these as being connected? Is that part of what makes them a set? Right? So different points that form a set, meaning somehow they are all deeply connected. Now, this over here, this is what comes up when you look up manifold and topological mapping. Zan, what is the name of the structure called? It was called like a something's finger, and I don't know how to say it, so I'm going to do everyone a favor. I'm not an abstract mathematician. I'm not going to butcher it. But this is how manifolds are actually represented in the field of math. So what I want us to break down here is the actual word in Hebrew that stands in place of manifold. So rebab, to become many, numerous, yet stemming from one original source. Collection of points forming a set. Numerous, yet stemming from one source. Has anyone ever seen this beautiful thing before? Okay. So this is only one set of data mapping of every cross-reference in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, okay? So Old Testament on the left, New Testament on the right. This particular data map has 63,779 cross-references. What about this color pattern? The people that mapped this data, before they begun, they assigned a specific color to a length of time. Okay, so this wasn't like they mapped all the data and they're like, well, now let's make it look pretty, right? They didn't like arbitrarily assign color. They assigned color to length and dimension before they begun. Does that look like something that has a serious designer behind it? Is that random? Is there any person here that has any sort of, like, could you be in denial enough to be like, That's, that could be totally random? Coincidence. Here's another one. Another group set off to do the same thing, map some data. These people found 340,000 cross-references. Okay? So Old Testament targets are blue, New Testament are red. Do you see things like, right, I know I wasn't here for your talk this morning, but 
in nature, we know that there are things that we can map that are just, they are part of natural law, like the Fibonacci sequence, et cetera. We know that things tend to occur in spirals. Again, are you gonna try to tell me that's coincidental? Do you know how many authors of the Bible there are? Do you know how many different people, independent of each other, not connected to each other at all over the span of 2,000 years, created these? That's not a coincidence. There's no way. Before we dig deeper, let's hit Mark 4.11. And he said to them, to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. In this instance, Jesus is saying these people are not able to paradigmatically move out of where they are to receive this information. They're not ready, they're not willing, they're in denial. And by speaking it in a parable, right, which is an abstraction, those that are ready to catch it, they're gonna catch it and they're going to grow their paradigm. Those that are not ready to catch it, what are they gonna do? It's not gonna make sense. They're gonna be like, there goes those crazy people again. I've met a lot of people in my Christian walk who think I'm the crazy one. And hey, am I crazy sometimes? Probably. I feel like you have to be to truly walk with the Lord the way he's genuinely called you to walk with him. You have to be willing to drop everything if he says, go here, go now, right? Taylor, you just did that. Taylor came to me and he's like, I've got a word. It's been a while. <laughs> Looked a little scared, but still I'm like, here's the mic go, buddy, right? When you're going to walk with the Lord, you can't do it on your terms. You can't do it the way it makes you feel comfortable. The last thing you ever want to do in your walk with God is say, could you wait like two days? I'm not ready yet. Or like, I have to take care of my, I have to take care of my kids. I don't know. What if they don't like me? That's not going to work. When we are ready to truly step into the fullness of God's manifold wisdom, we have to be ready to receive the message so that we can actually take action. That is why Jesus filtered his information. A parable uses concrete information to create and illustrate abstract ideas. So let's understand first what an abstract idea is. So an abstract idea is an idea feeling quality that is not physical or material, right? Can you see an abstract idea? No. Abstract ideas can be immaterial, so they are spiritual potentially rather than just purely physical, and they often are beyond the boundary of the third dimension. So in this way, when Jesus is speaking in parables, it's serving as this paradigmatic filter. What this does on the other side is it sets a group of people apart. When you become a believer in Christ, you are set apart because you have understanding, you've caught the message, you've caught the wisdom to live your life differently. A lot of people that say they are believers in Jesus have not caught the message. They're still stuck in paradigmatic entrenchment and because of it, they're gonna look at you and tell you that you're doing it wrong. I want to speak into your life today no matter what anybody tells you, you go to God and you find out if you're right with God. If you have something to repent to God for, you do it with him. Ask God to search your heart. Am I being led astray or am I right on target? Because I'm here to tell you, in this time and place that we're in right now, what God is revealing and releasing through our lives will make Christians uncomfortable. It's not your job to make them feel comfortable. It's your job to be obedient to God. Matthew 13, 9 through 11, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Who's ever had an experience where you can know so much that you use it against yourself? Anyone? Okay. So let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Did we get too much knowledge too soon out of time and then use it against ourselves? 
Okay, somebody even brought this up to me today, or not today, a week ago, about the iPhone having the apple with the bite taken out of it, and how like now we're sucked into our phone. We want information and quick access to everything, and it literally is a representation of the Garden of Eden. Does that blow anybody's mind? I never thought about it before. Literally, you are holding a representation via technology of the moment that Satan took us all out. And then you're tra- those same people are like, God isn't real. Then why'd you put the bite of the apple on my iPhone? <laughs> it sounds like you know something that you're trying to make me forget so that you can carry out your plan. And I'm on to you. Not all can handle the truth. People, if they are not healed emotionally, if they're not able to have true self-control, they're going to use this information not only to harm themselves, but to harm others. Let's dig into a little bit about this idea of being set apart, right? So I think a lot of people that have childhood wounds don't like this idea that throughout the Bible, it seems like God plays favorites. These people, not these people. You're chosen, you're not chosen. I'll see about you. Oh, I'm going to take all of you out. Then there's also this idea, once you become a new creation, you're supposed to be set apart, right? You, you should be an example to others who are not believers. You should stand out in a crowd, not because you're wearing flashy clothes, but because your heart is pure and your fruit is bountiful. Being set apart doesn't mean that you're special. It literally means that you have caught the word and you have the authority and the understanding to live your life differently. Your life should look different than people in your life that are not believers. Not because you're better, not because you try harder, but because you actually have God's manifold wisdom available to you when you need it. How many people in your life that are Christian live a life that you hear this term all the time, holier than thou, right? Like, oh, look at your holier than thou attitude, right? I always will jokingly say turtleneck and pearls type people until I realized that some of my favorite people were turtleneck and pearls and they're like, I take that offensively. I'm like, all right, like a church Karen, a church Karen, okay? So they believe somehow that through their act, their actions, their righteousness and judgment of others somehow sets them apart. That's not the right set apart. That's not it. Set apart is unwavering when the world wants to try to push you down. When other Christians want to try to attack the message you're delivering and you don't waver for a moment, don't even get pulled into it. In fact, continue to show mercy, kindness, that's set apart. Set apart is not how much you can judge other people in your community or how righteously you look at somebody else's walk with God and be like, well, you can't do that if you're still doing this. That's not set apart. Set apart is having a different operating manual and actually letting that inform every action, every word, every thought that you have in your life for the rest of your life. So Hebrew for holy is kodesh, and it means to set apart. So when the angels cry, holy, holy, holy is God, they're like, he's set apart. So, like He's so set apart, I can't even comprehend it. It's so different then how I'm operating, I'm in awe. Being raised Jewish, you hear this word a lot. Being set apart doesn't mean that you are in judgment of others. It means that you have actually become that expression of God's wisdom in your life. So I want everyone to actually physically raise a hand if you've had the Bible come alive, transform, or become brand new, even if you've read that before. Okay? The Bible is a data map of information, and it comes from one source, right? We understand this, Ray Bob. This is why, wait for it, we have 66 books in the Bible, minimum, right? I personally believe that the book of Enoch was removed for a very important reason and should be included. That would make it 67. 66 books at a minimum, we'll say, written over 2,000 years 
by how many authors? 29 plus nine, that's a lot of authors. That's a lot of different people trying to catch a word from God, put it onto the page to have it coincidentally make that pattern, don't you think? Suspect, at least, minimum. Like even if you're looking at it from a scientific perspective, like we were looking at it yesterday, that would be a really tough one to try to break apart. Like, hmm, that is an oddly symmetrical pattern for this to have been a complete accident. So Old Testament, 29 authors, 39 books. New Testament, at least nine authors, 27 books. Look at this. The beginning references the end. The end goes back. Do you see how this happens throughout the entire thing? Impossible. That is a data map of information that has been plotted at all different moments in time coming from one source. Who hears the word algorithm a lot these days, even if it's in reference to social media? Oh, the algorithm, the algorithm. Okay, so I want to set off on this idea of is the Bible itself an algorithm, right? And we always think about algorithms relating to technology. I want to make a really clear distinction here, and I think this is ultimately, if we do extract one ultimate battle that's happening in the Bible, it's organic, God-given creation versus what? Artificial creation, right? So organic versus artificial. What God ordained and made and what is trying to be hijacked and created from its starting place, right? Arguably God versus Satan, right? Light versus dark, good versus evil. An algorithm is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer. It doesn't have to be by a computer, but especially by a computer. Now, a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations, does that sound kind of like what the Bible is? Has anyone read the Bible that way, where it's kind of like a rules to live your best life? Maybe not your most fun life, if we're being honest. But your best life from the soul-spirit level, right? It is a rule book that is supposed to help us operate in the physical world and in the spirit world simultaneously, which is a hard feat because we are trying to see in the spirit while being blinded by what's right in front of us. And often in our walk with God, what we physically see is not what God's asking us to see. He's asking us to see beyond what we are currently blinded with. Because we're operating blind, we need an algorithm to help us move through it, yeah? Has anyone actually found some deep and profound healing through the Bible that they didn't even realize they were looking for? I know I have. Let's go one layer even deeper. This is, so in Hebrew, it's called the Aleph Bet, instead of the alphabet. Did you go to Hebrew school, Zan? So you know, Aleph, Bet, Vet, Gimel, Dal, Hey, Vav, Zan, Tesh, Re. Okay, so I had to go to Hebrew school when I was a little kid, clearly. Um, the Hebrew Aleph, Bet, can actually be broken down into multidimensional code. Follow me now. In Hebrew, every letter has a numerical value and a similar meaning attached to it, right? So this is an example of a group of Jewish scholars that created some sort of codex to read different things from the Bible and even use it to predict global events with high accuracy. We're not going to get too much into that, but it's important for us to understand that Hebrew characters have an alphanumeric value and a symbol or deep, deeper meaning attached to each individual character. So when we're talking about the Bible being multidimensional, we can even truly use mathematical terms to hold this as a true statement. So number one, you can read the Bible left to right, and then in Hebrew, you're actually reading right to left. So I just wanted to make sure to make that clear. In Hebrew, you actually read the opposite direction. This would be kind of more of a one-dimensional experience. 
You can also break down the Hebrew character one at a time, and it actually unveil, unveils a sentence within a word. So hold that for one second. You can have a word that if you actually go one level, one level deeper, each character creates another sentence. You can have one word actually become one whole sentence. You follow? Okay. So we're going to describe that as somehow taking this thing that should just be simple and it's adding another layer onto it, okay? You can also use the numerical values of the Bible to create three-dimensional depth. Once you plot the numbers, you actually, and they can, you can look this up online, you can actually see the depth to the Bible once you shift it to alphanumeric value. Right, one would look like this, two would look like this, three, four, right? It actually has depth to it. You can also follow the cross-reference data maps to unveil that the Bible itself, although written by at least 39 authors, over 2,000 years transcends our experience of space-time. This is a five-dimensional book, minimum. It is both the beginning and the end, and it was extracted from invisible reality. Who remembers when we went through that circle yesterday of trying to understand like the visible versus the invisible, the conscious versus the unconscious? The invisible reality is not constrained by the laws of the physical world, and yet we keep having people try to dispute or refute biblical truth because they're trying to use physical rules. You realize how silly this is, right? Let's just go back and on. Just look one more time. One more time. There it is. If we're trying to use the laws of our physical world to try to give deeper meaning to that, we're using the wrong paradigm to try to get to the truth, right? That would be like trying to use one of the theories that we talked about that was trying to get to basically how everything is an abuse of power. If we tried to apply that paradigm to this, we would definitely not get where we're trying to go. We cannot apply a paradigm that is constricted to the physical world, the third dimension, to this book. We'll always come up dry. This is an example of what five-dimensionality would be plotted out like. So when we really look at what the Bible is, it truly is a document that is living, that transcends space-time. So here was the example of what we looked at yesterday where we've got invisible reality, visible reality, unconscious reality, conscious reality, right? So when we're looking here, objective reality, this is often what we're trying to apply to biblical concepts. Sometimes this holds true. Other times we're missing something because we're looking in the wrong space, right? We're, we're looking for visible, concrete information to describe things that are immaterial. So let's look at this statement. God created all things in the heavens and the earth, okay? So let's look at Colossians 1.6. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Again, I go back to this idea when people are like, oh, you're just making up that mumbo jumbo. You're trying to apply your like sciency, new agey. No, it actually says it right here. It goes as far as to define, no, no, not just the visible, the things that you can kick and touch, but also the invisible. The Bible's very specific with words. So we want to be very clear here that what we're, if we're looking at it as a data set, all data, known and unknown, so the things that we know we know and the things that we don't know we don't know, it was all created by him. If it's here on earth or it's in the heavens, it was created by him. Now, this is the part that people don't like. All things. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble, right? That tends to be the sticking point. Well, why would God make these bad creatures too? Does that, does that ruffle anybody else's feathers? Right, why would God make the bad things? We're not gonna dissect that in today's session because that would take a whole extra two hours. But I want us to try to understand, try to get a visual in your head. 
if you had to create a square that had data represented by dots, and you tried to say that every dot that could ever exist in the world can fit inside this square, how big would that square need to be? Pretty big, right? People that you've met in your walk with God, how big are their squares? Pretty small, right? Like sometimes their, their squares are really small. When they're emotionally triggered, their square gets even smaller, right? If they're triggered by you, sometimes their square is non-existent. I want to ask you this question. Is the biblical paradigm, if we conceptualize a paradigm as a space, is the biblical paradigm fixed? Are the boundaries of the biblical paradigm set or flexible? Who has some ideas here? You think flexible? What else? What else we got? What were you going to say? <laughs> well, technically this has no holes. <laughs> Okay, so it's a bit of a trick question. That shape on the left could become the shape in the center, right? And it could become the shape on the right. At first glance, they don't all look like the same shape, but arguably, you can take that space and you can stretch it this way, you can stretch it this way, and often through programming, we are taught that we we can't even go to the boundaries of this paradigm because then you're going to go to hell. Don't ask any questions. We end up not going to the edges of our space that God is calling us to, to be like, let me reveal what is the truth out here. How far can you stretch it? Okay? Let's say that everything is possible is in this blue square. Okay? When you grow up with a legalist perspective, right, strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to a religious or moral code, it constrains your possibilities. So it can constrain how you're perceiving that information. So we're taking what could be and we're starting to limit it in many ways out of fear. So here's where I want us to kind of land is this idea, we know if you're operating in a legalist sort of viewpoint, things like spiritual warfare, what might you say about spiritual warfare? What's happening? What am I missing? Something. Spider. Okay. Gord doesn't like spiders. I'm the spider killer in our house. Scorpion, yeah, scorpions, that's all you. I don't know what muscle scorpions. So here's, here's what I want us to... I'm almost done. Let's keep them... Let's push those kids back in that room for a second. Love you, but also go back in there. So we can come from that very strict perspective where things that are clearly in the Bible are not accessible. Oh, well, we don't like talking about spiritual warfare. I have questions about the Nephilim. It kind of seems like those would be non-humanoid beings. Oh, we don't talk about that, right? So a lot of times, if you're operating in this square, even if it's in the Bible, you take the perspective, that makes me uncomfortable, so we don't talk about it. And if you want to talk about it, you could go to hell. <laughs> so why don't you not do it? I want us to get really clear here. I'm not saying that all things go, because they don't, right? In the Bible, there is clearly one reality, one truth that we should all be in pursuit of. However, I want us to see that there is a way to be in a biblical paradigm and stay there without it being a limitation. The biblical paradigm is, in fact, a key. It is our way to seek truth so long as we are stepping into a paradigm that we allow God to expand and show us where those edges are, right? We should ultimately always seek truth, but we can't just push away things that are clearly contained in his word because it makes us uncomfortable. God is here to make you uncomfortable, right? Just like 
even just thinking of the manifold wisdom of God, like that should make you uncomfortable. Things that God has revealed to me over my life have quite literally given me day after day after day of reality vertigo to a point where I didn't know how to be a human for a while. It can be challenging, but I'm telling you, God is a good God and he will help you continue to move forward. Now, instead of seeing the biblical paradigm as this kind of like, limiting, oh, you're such a square, oh, you're so conservative, right? Oh, I can't, you see everything from a biblical paradigm? Instead of seeing it as this limitation, here's how I want you to look at it, right? Let's say that every single square is a different paradigm. The biblical paradigm functions like this key where it's like, once we're in it and we allow God to show us those edges, anytime we move it over, data that exists on earth or in heaven, it should help us understand truth that actually creates its own paradigm, right? It shows us how to measure anything that we look at because all data points created by one source, if we're able to use this, we're able to see truth, his truth, wherever we go. What this biblical paradigm does, it creates measurement, it defines truth, it delineates spiritual laws and how they interact with the spirit realm. There's no other paradigm that does that, ladies and gents. If you want to understand how the invisible realm interacts with the physical realm, you have to understand the Bible. It teaches us to understand the immaterial world. And I'm telling you right now, to walk faithfully with the Lord, you have to understand the immaterial world. If not, it's all just going to feel like one big setup where you're just supposed to look like an idiot all the time. So what would happen if we approached research through a very expansive biblical paradigm? Can you imagine? Like, what would happen if we applied a biblical paradigm to scientific research? All different types of medical research, right? I mean, this is hopefully what Zan's about to do, so <laughs> here's hoping, kid. Science, and I want you to really hear me when I say this, science does not disprove God. Certain paradigms that we follow in those fields are created to hide the truth. That is, that is the truth. They try to disprove God by rigging the system. They know that I'm telling you right now, they know those paradigms are false. That's why on your Apple iPhone, they're laughing at you with the bite taken out of the apple. You think that's an accident? No way. They know they're creating these false layers for you to get lost in. They're getting you lost on purpose. There is a way out. Satan would be exceptionally mad if that question actually was answered in our world. If we actually applied a true expansive biblical paradigm to the field of science, he'd be big mad, <laughs> big mad. God is calling us to allow him to unfold his wisdom within us. And so many of you are scared and wanting control and wanting to fit into your church group and look like a good Christian. How is God going to do that in your life if you're so busy trying to look like a church Karen? I'm telling you, like, God wants you to roll up your sleeves and be like, all right, Lord, whatever you want here. These are the questions that I want you to ask yourself this week. Number one, where are you constraining your biblical paradigm? And what is the cost of doing that? What are you doing it for? What's the motivation? What is the cost in your life big picture? Is that what Holy Spirit is asking of you? Or is that just your carnal mind wanting to be comfortable and safe? And then number three, are you allowing yourself to be led? Or are you too busy trying to be a good Christian? The world is full of good Christians. I think it's time for us to grow, right? Good Christians, they got us to a certain place. God wants us to stretch. There's so much more that we can be doing in this time and place, stretch yourself. Don't just try to stay comfortable. Let God show you his character and reveal his true nature to you. Because when you're really ready to receive it, it's going to happen.
All right, let's all close our eyes and let's send this. Let's send this off with a word. Lord, we are grateful that you love us so much that you pursue us even when we run from you, that you're patient even when we try to prove you wrong or try to prove that you're not real. And God, we just ask that right now in this room, you reach every single person and you help ignite their spirit to step boldly into what you have called them to do, that you would use their voice, that you would expand their thinking, and that you would help them truly come into a deep repentance for any way that they've tried to put you in a box or block you from moving boldly in their life. God, use every single one of us. Use us for your will. We are grateful for you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, put that. <laughs>